Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Josie Gaylord, and I'm going to get started with the first half of the presentation. Um, and then Tom will jump in with sizing your HVAC system for the second half. So happy to be here. Thanks, Marissa, for the invite. Um, let's get started. So first of all, home electrification, as um, probably you all know, is important for climate change. It's important for as we move into the future, uh, for moving away from natural gas in homes. And the focus of today's presentation will be primarily electrification of existing homes, but many of the techniques could be applied to new homes as well. So one of the things we'll be discussing um, now is why a plan is important. So when Tom, Tom, Tom and I have done a lot of um, work with homeowners and we've come across a lot of different situations uh, electrifying homes. So we'll just share some of the things that we've learned. One is uh, it's very common for a homeowner to decide they want to uh, frequently buy an electric car as sort of their first step in electrification. And um, one of the, the sort of issues we see, and especially in a home that might be constrained by its electric panel, so an older home, maybe built in the 50s um, that has a 100 amp panel, that um, once they buy that electric car, they decide to put in a charger in the home and opt for a 50 amp car charger. But that's a really big car charger. Um, and it's what sort of default by default that the uh, car companies recommend to people. In fact, it's going to take up a huge amount of their uh, electrical space on their panel and um, with their service line, forcing a, a panel upgrade later. So, um, so this is something that we commonly see, you know, the contractors who might come and install that first car charger for someone isn't really thinking that the whole home is eventually going to go electric and maybe they want to sort of think judiciously about, you know, what each um, appliance that goes in. So they're not really thinking about that. Um, so what, you know, the result is you might have a 50 amp car charger or a 50 amp HVAC system that goes in and then the person goes to install, let's say, a heat pump water heater, and contractor says, oop, sorry, your panel's full. Um, you're going to need a, a bigger panel. You're going to need a service line upgrade. You need to get the utility involved. Suddenly, there's potentially long wait times if, if the utilities say they need to study you know, whether this service line upgrade or upsizing is possible. And with any um, replacement of a main electrical panel and upsizing the service line, which is the line from the um, utility pole into the home, you're looking at at least $5,000, at least in um, California, um, if it's an overhead service line, and that's the best case scenario. There are many homes where the service lines actually run underground, and those uh, we're, we're seeing quotes around $20,000 for that. So. If you can avoid these things, the, the homeowner is in a much better place and a plan can really help with that. So here's some of the benefits of electrifying with a plan. So again, it helps avoid that 5,000 plus electric panel upgrade cost. Uh, it can provide a homeowner with this a roadmap. So here the, you know, the homeowner gets to decide which, which gas appliances say they wanna replace with electric. And then it, uh, um, then they have that planned because they may not do this work all at once. In fact, I think it's uncommon for homeowners to do the work all at once because it can be costly. So many people sort of space it out and replace appliance, gas appliances as they burn out. So this could be happening over a five or 10 year period, in which case a plan is very helpful because the homeowner may not recall, oh, what, you know, um, what type of equipment do I need here? You know, what type of circuit, et cetera. So the plan also helps guide trade people. So instead of installing, say, a 50 amp uh, HVAC system, maybe they could get a more, a much more power efficient um, uh, uh, HVAC system, like a Mitsubishi, for example, that might use 17 amps to do the same to do the same job. So it kind of gives some constraints to the tradespeople. So by um, avoiding um, unnecessary work, costly mistakes. Uh, the plan um, kind of has a very clear, lays out very clearly what needs to be done to help the homeowner achieve their goal. Having a plan also helps facil 
facilitate right sizing of equipment. So sometimes contractors want to kind of oversize their piece of equipment um, just to kind of quote unquote be safe. Um, but there's a lot of downsides to that. And so by having a plan that's been thought through ahead of time, you can, again, kind of constrain the, the contractor on, on their um, often sort of knee-jerk reaction, which is to oversize. And then um, in the end, the home, this home that has a plan and is fully electrified now is more likely to be much more power efficient because you've had to carefully choose each piece of equipment so they'll fit on the panel. And it's more also much more likely to be grid friendly. So as we look out 10 or 20 years in California where we're trying to be on a 100% renewable grid um, and um, be completely off of fossil fuels, we're gonna need to um, increase the size of the grid, but we, we will have to do less of that if each home is power efficient and able to, um, for example, load shift, um, which some of the equipment we use in our plans um, does that. Uh, in order to stay on the electric panel, the existing panel. So panel optimization really works, especially if the house is under 3,000 square feet and located in a mild climate, which most of California is, although obviously there's some like mountain regions where that wouldn't be the case. So in those places, a 100 amp panel is usually sufficient. Um, there's sort of a thought out there that a 100 amp panel is really small. In fact, it's not. Um, 100 amp panels were used, were, were um, this, state of the art for homes uh, through the 50s and 60s. And in those times, our, our electrical equipment was much less efficient. And so um, those panels are actually quite big. Now our equipment is much more efficient. And so you can put a lot more equipment on, on that panel. So the only caveat here is that homes with 60 amp panels or smaller probably should be Josie, your audio cut out for me. I'm not sure if it cut out for anyone else. It, it cut out for me. Yeah, it cut out for me too. All right, uh, this is Tom. So I'll, I'll try to fill in for Josie while she gets her audio back together. But uh, what she was just mentioning was that uh, when we find homes with 60 amp panels or smaller, those are the homes that probably need to be upsized to about 100 amps or larger. Uh, 100 amps being able to provide 24 kilowatts of power. That's a lot of power. And so we're able to electrify a whole home. And uh, Josie, are you back on audio? Not seeing that. Um, but the other thing we're able to show with this, with making the plan is it'll help the trades see how much space is allocated for each one of their projects. So how much space is available for them to do the car charger, how much is available for the HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. Uh, and so those kind of things. And, and All right, where, where did I leave off? Sorry about this. Uh, we've just gone over the, I, I kind of finished up on the uh, slide with the plan on it, the, and the panel diagram. So there you are at the next slide. Okay, great. All right. So key components of an electrification plan, there are four main components. Um, one is a recommended equipment list. So that'll tell the contractors who um, may be wanting to do this work, the key um, pieces of equipment that have been selected for the home. And these are usually very power efficient. So it's important to know that they all kind of fit together in um, like, a, like a puzzle uh, to fit on the panel. So that's important. Um, number two in the electrification plan, we'll go into this in much more detail in class three. So this is very, very high level, just sort of skimming it, but uh, electrical load calculations per the national electrical code sections 220.83 or 220.87. So that's something that we'll learn how to do um, in class two, and that'll be a part of the plan. A project list for the contractor. So specif specifying, you know, what are the exact installation projects that need to be done? You know, for each appliance that needs to be installed, uh, what are, where's the location, what's the size, um, what are any constraints if it's going in an attic? Um, you know, is there an access door that needs to, that it needs to go through photos, et cetera. And then number four, a wiring plan. So for each piece of equipment, you need a circuit um, of a certain size with a certain breaker 
um, size. Okay, so those are the four components of the electrification plan. So just a note, homeowners can do their own plan and um, you know, it'll take them a little bit more time. So I say, I say, below, say below that a homeowner might take three hours to do, um, put together a plan, collect all the data, do some of the number crunching. Um, for an expert, it can take as little as 30 minutes. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna get into, if we're kind of step back and thinking about forming a plan, the first thing you need to do is gather the data. So here we're gonna look at um, the, the three places that data for your electrification plan are gonna come from. There are three main sources. One is the utility data that show the current, um, the home's current energy needs. So that's gonna be gas data and electric data. It's really good to gather this information if you can sort of connect with the homeowner beforehand, get them to download this information and send it to you beforehand because it gives you a picture of kind of what you're working with. Um, number two is homeowner preferences. That can be done either before a home visit or at a home visit. And then number three, the observations, measurements, and photos that are done usually at a home visit, although there's some um, folks who do this work who are experimenting with um, doing it remotely. So having the homeowner do some of the measurements and photos, et cetera. Next slide. All right, utility data. So um, this is the first, number one on that list of uh, types of data. So electricity usage for data, uh, usage history for the home. This will come from your electricity uh, utility and it's usually downloadable from the utilities website um, if you look for their green button. Um, Tom and I generally work in the Bay Area, but we worked, I worked with Marissa to see for the utilities in the 3C rent territory, um, how this works. And it was all possible to download this data. So from SoCal Edison, pg and &E, SoCal Gas. So ideally, the electricity usage data would be 15 minute interval data, but 60 minute interval is okay. So you're gonna have a snapshot uh, in time for a whole year in 15 minute intervals of how much uh, electricity the home was using. Same for gas. So again, ideally would be one year of interval data. Daily is great. Although I noticed that SoCal Gas was offering it, I think hourly, which is, which is wonderful. It's more than pg and &E's. Um, gas division is offering customers uh, who get gas from PG&E. So anyway, so that's plenty of information and that'll help us know kind of what we're starting with with the home. Next slide. All right, so then we get to homeowner preferences. This can be done you know, while you're doing a home visit or it could be done on the phone beforehand. Uh, some just some key questions that will be helpful to forming the plan. One is, so which gas appliances do you want to replace, right? They may have um, two gas appliances left. Maybe they already have an electric dryer, so they don't have a gas dryer. Um, and maybe they have an electric cooktop. So all they need to replace is their furnace and their water heater. Uh, do you want to have an EV charger? So that's an important part of the plan because it can be a high electric load. So you want to consider it... Um, in your, um, in your planning process. If they don't have solar battery now, would they want it in the future? Again, that needs a spot in the um, electric panel. So we wanna make, make sure that's uh, part of the, at least considered part of the plan. What's the ideal location for your new HVAC compressor? So they're gonna have a new, if they're going from a gas furnace to a heat pump HVAC, they're gonna have a box that replaces their current furnace called an air handler, but then they're gonna have another piece of equipment called a compressor, which is gonna be outside. You know, people who already have air conditioning already have one of these. Um, so, but if you don't have air conditioning, you know, you'll need a place for kind of like a suitcase size piece of equipment on the side, probably on the side yard over your house. Uh, the ideal location for a new EV charger, number five. So, you know, people, some people want them on the outside of their garage. Some people want them on the inside of their garage. You know, um, people, people should be thinking about where do they park their car um, overnight. Number six, how many miles do you drive in a typical week? Because that'll help us size your EV charger. Most people, it's 
you know, um, a hundred roughly miles per week. But, uh, so for most people, a small EV charger is going to be fine. We have, we occasionally run across like a traveling salesperson, or in one case we had a, like a dog walker who did, I think 200 miles a day. So those people will need larger car chargers. For cooktops, do they prefer buttons or knobs? Um, for dryers, do could they live with a European-sized dryer? There's a lot of European-sized heat pump dryers. Um, there's only one uh, that's size the typical American size that's a heat pump uh, made by Whirlpool, but um, they have a lot more options if they could go with a smaller dryer. Um, would they like a combo washer dryer that you know can save some real estate in your garage if you're looking for a space, let's say for a water heater, etc. Um, and then are they happy with the performance of their current gas appliances or since they're switching to electric, is this a time to make some adjustments like, oh, our hot water heater, you know, never provided enough hot water or um, our HVAC system um, was always, you know, was, would blast on and off and was like too big, for example. So those kinds of changes can be made. Next slide. All right, so we're going to go into much more detail about the observations and measurements that you would make on a home visit. But just to give you an idea, observations would be things like, what's the shutoff breaker capacity on the main panel? Um, are there open breaker spaces in the main panel and subpanels? And then measurements would be things like the dimensions of the spaces for new appliances. So how much space do you have to get a water heater into this space if you needed to, for example, increase the size of the tank? Or what are the dimensions of the hatches that go into the attic or the crawl space? Um, if the contractor is gonna to need to access those, say to get to a furnace or to put insulation in, for example. Okay, next slide. All right, so there's a lot of data to collect through the home visit. So I've tried to group it into these uh, stations, I'm calling them. Um, and we've got, I think, eight here. So main panel and sub panel. These, you can think about these as um, both kind of groupings of data, but also like physically when you're traveling around the home, like how you might um, you know, think about getting through the home. So Tom and I often will start with the homeowner at the main panel. So we introduce ourselves um, and then ask like, can we see your main, main electrical panel? And so at the main panel, you we can gather a bunch of data. Next would be all your existing electric appliances. So what's already using up some of your panel space? Um, and we'll have a list of those later. Uh, then each gas appliance that needs to be replaced, you know, walk us to your gas cooktop, your gas water heater, your gas furnace. Um, now let's, you know, show us the EV charger where you'd like to have an EV charger uh, installed. And then uh, we also take a look at the attic and the crawl spaces, uh, both to look for ductwork, insulation. There might be a gas appliances in those places. Um, and assess insulation levels. Finally, we make sure we've um, noted any uh, information about vents. So where the vents located, how many, um, this is uh, um, heating or cooling vents in the home, where they look located, and then um, ductwork insulation, uh, making any notes about those things. And then for solar and battery, uh, just a couple, uh, the, the solar and battery installation installers are very adept at coming into a home and doing a lot of this work. So we don't need to gather a ton of data, but we just gather a few pieces of information about, for example, the roof type and, um, you know, where the sol solar panels might go on the home. Next slide. All right. So um, now let's dive into exactly what data we would collect at each of those stations. So First station is the main panel. So here you might just gather a couple pieces of general information about the home. One is the square footage of the home. That's gonna be critical to your load calculations. And then the year the home was built. Um, this is important to know for um, uh, having a hunch about how much insulation might be in the walls, for example, because you know what was kind of required by code um, at different um, decades. Next is what's the shutoff breaker capacity of the main panel. Here you can see on a photo on the right, um, the, the shutoff breaker is that large black one at the bottom. And then um, in a close up at the top on the right, you can see in a uh, little yellow circle, 
is the edge of that um, breaker um, that would flip back and forth. And it's usually printed on that. So in this case, it's 125, it's very hard to see, but um, it's 125 amps. So that, you know, is the, um, uh, when the house was most recently either built or most recently had a service line um, run to it, that was what was designed um, for the service line. So 125 amps is what you're working with for this home. The other thing we would note is how many open breaker spaces there are both in the main panel and the sub panels. And, um, you know, a main breaker space, physical breaker spaces, uh, there may not be any tier I, but um, in many cases, you can actually fit multiple breakers called slim breakers into one physical slot. So we would assess like, is there, have this, has that already been done or is there room to um, fit more breakers into an existing slot? Um, the bus bar capacity of the main panel and sub panels is helpful to know, especially if you're gonna be running solar into the home because there's some limitations there. And then uh, the feeder breaker capacity of any sub panels. So I would ask the homeowner, show me any sub panels that might be there in the home. Hopefully they'll know where they are. And then you would wanna notice from the main panel, um, what is the breaker capacity to each sub panel if you're gonna be running um, equipment into the sub panels. Next slide. So for each, so, so next after we leave the main panel, we'd be looking at the existing electric appliances and we'll list a whole bunch that you would be kind of asking the homeowner about. But the information that you're gonna gather for each one is this nameplate, which there's a picture on the right. And I do take pictures of these because um, it's just helpful to have a record. So what you're looking for on the nameplate is the voltage and the amps for the equipment. Um, the voltage, sometimes it has something confusing like what's in red here, which is 120 slash 240. And so you're wondering, well, which is it? Um, but you can tell by the plug. If it's a normal plug, it's 120. If it's a drier size plug, it's 240. And then the amps um, is going to be most important. So that'll dictate um, you know, how much panel space it's gonna take up. For major appliances, we're defining that as that are either affixed to the house or they have a dedicated circuit in the panel. Um, that's how the code defines it. And then, um, like I said, take a photo of these. It's just helpful to have for your records. Next slide. All right, so this is a very long list, sort of an eye chart, um, but you'll have this information coming to you so you can study it more closely. But these are the, uh, there, there's some more, most common, and most commonly you're gonna find these big electric appliances in the kitchen. Um, so that's where we end up spending most of our time gathering these nameplates. But, um, you know, it's just good to ask, like, in their, any bathrooms, do you have, like, a heater? Because those can be um, high amperage. So just run through with the homeowner, you know, do you have any of these things currently in the home? Next slide. Okay, so now we're going to get to the gas appliances. So we're going to walk to each of gas appliances that they want to replace. And we're going to ask a bunch of questions and do measurements. So at the cooking, we're going to notice how many burners do they have? In this case, the, burn, the, um, the range on the right is a uh, five burner. Uh, so we'll just note that and we'll ask like, is, do you want to replace it with something identical? Or maybe they want to expand. They want to go to six burners or eight burners. But anyway, this is a good time to sort that out with them. Physical dimensions, the most important for a range is the width. So is it 30, is it 36? Those are the most common, 48, I guess, for a, um, for a large commercial range. And then uh, range type is important. So this is a freestanding range, which has a back. Um, uh, the slide in just slides right in to the counter and doesn't have that back. So you would use the, like, the tile backsplash instead of that, um, that back piece on the range. And the slide-in ranges, the, the controls are usually on the front. So knobs or um, buttons um, would be on the front uh, or the top, but toward the, toward the user. The number of oven cavities, in this case, this, this range has one, but some people are, might have wall ovens where there's two. Um, and then finally, at each time you go to a gas appliance, you want to notice like, okay, where is the circuit, the new electric circuit that's going to feed this? Like, where's it going to come from? Where's the closest electric panel? Is it the main panel? Do we want to put in a sub panel? So you want to notice kind of where is that closest panel? And then how long would the circuit be 
um, from that panel to this appliance because that'll be important for your wiring plan. And then just take a photo of, of the appliance. So if you do a bunch of these, you can remember what it was you were dealing with. Next slide. All right, gas water heater would be next. So the things to notice are, is it a tank water heater or is it tankless? This is obviously is a tank water heater. What's the size? Um, it, that's usually written right on, on a label on the water heater. Is it 40 gallon, 50 gallon, 65 gallon? Um, is there a recirc pump? So these are popular, they're challenging to work with um, heat pump water heaters. So we don't really like them. We advise people to get rid of them, but um, you know, if people are really attached to them, this is something that would recirculate hot water into the line so that as soon as they turn on the um, water, there's, there's hot water there. Um, what's the location? Is it in a garage, basement, an attic? Um, the physical dimensions of the space for the water heater. So in many cases, going to a heat pump water heater because the recovery time is slower, we, we suggest that they upsize. So if they have a 40 gallon tank now, we might recommend a 50 gallon or even a 65 gallon if they have a larger family, um, just to give a little cushion. Um, is there enough space around it? So heat pump water heaters collect heat from the air, from the ambient air around them. So they need at least 400 cubic feet feet of space around them. So if they're in a tiny closet without much ventilation, that's not a good space. Uh, what's the route for a condensate drainage? So heat pump water heaters have a little bit of clean water that um, condensates out and needs to be pumped off. So um, sometimes that can just be run via gravity and you know, through a pipe that might um, go to a vent to the outside of, of the home, maybe into like a flower bed. Other times, like in this case, it was right next, the um, water heater was right next to a utility sink. So that pipe could just be run right to that sink. And, and in this case, it probably would need a pump to get it up over um, the lip of that sink. So one other thing to notice is, would be the water heater efficiency. Generally, this type of water heater is about 80% efficient. So only if someone had like a really fancy newer water heater, might it be much more efficient? Generally, they're gonna be about 80%. And then again, notice where would the circuit um, come from? In this case, we decided to install a sub panel um, in the laundry room right behind the water heater. And so we knew it was gonna be about maybe a six foot run for the circuit. And we could say that that sub panel was gonna be the feeder panel. And again, take a photo. Next slide. For the gas furnace, uh, you'd wanna notice, is it ducted, central, central, um, uh, central like forced air furnace or is it a wall furnace? We, we've actually seen 80 year old wall furnaces here in California or a floor furnace. Um, again, those tend to be older. What's the location? Is it basement? Is it garage? Physical dimensions? so that we'll know kind of what size the air handler can um, be to, to go in here. Again, condensate drainage, this, this air handler has a similar um, requirement, which is it'll have a little bit of condensate coming out that needs to go to a utility sink or to drain to the outside. What's the furnace, furnace efficiency? This is an essential, but it's helpful to know um, when we're doing our heat loss uh, or our heat requirements, heat, um, load requirements for the home, it's helpful to know, is this a standard efficiency furnace, which again, they're generally about 80% efficient, or do they have a fancy newer one, which might be like 95% efficient, because that will affect how much gas they're using currently and how much we should assume they would use for the heat pump. Uh, again, what would the circuit length be? What would the feeder panel be? And take a photo. Next one. All right, so with a clothes dryer, Drum size, what do they have now? Is it the standard American drum size, 7.4 cubic feet? Um, could they go smaller? You know, it's a question for them. Um, what are the physical dimensions of the dryer? And then again, when running a new circuit, where would that come from and how long would it be? Next. All right, and just a sort of couple of appliances that um, we don't see often, but we do see occasionally um, gas fireplaces and pool heaters. So physical dimensions of those, 
one that's really important, especially for pool heaters, is what is the current heating capacity? So how many BTUs of heat does it deliver per hour? That's important to know because you're going to try to find a replacement piece of equipment that can deliver. Um, it won't be as high, but um, you'll be trying to match um, that. And um, again, circuit length, feeder panel, and take a photo. Next one. All right, EV charger. So it's great to ask them, where would you like you know, your EV charger? Would they imagine having a charger or like this, just a plug where they could put in a mobile charger, a plug in a mobile charger, for example. Um, and then circuit length, feeder panel, take a photo. Next one. So for attic and crawl space, you're assessing a couple of things. One is what's the condition of their insulation? So if you want to have them, um, for example, they have a larger home, but you want to try to fit them on a three ton um, heat pump HVAC system, you might need to add, recommend that they add some insulation to their attic if they don't have any, for example, or if what they have is sort of patchy. Um, and doing any sort of energy efficiency projects as you go is going to improve the comfort for, um, for the homeowner and, you know, uh, bring down their bills. One other thing you're assessing for is their knob and tube wiring here, because that can limit um, what can be done insulation wise. Next, um, distance between joints helps um, anyone who's quoting on an insulation project to know like what width vats they could use. The square footage of the attic or the crawl space, and again, estimates are fine, but just to give any contractor who's bidding on this an idea of what, you know, how many square feet they're working with. The height, um, minimum, maximum height of a space, both the crawl space or the attic is important for the contractor to know, you know, if it's only 12 inches, that's a really hard space for them to work. So they're going to definitely tack on a premium for that. Um, and then similarly, access door dimensions. Uh, we didn't really think about this, but a contractor gave us a head, heads up that uh, if the access door to the attic or the crawl space is really small, it may not, the equipment you want to use may not actually fit through that, that access door. Um, so that's a really important dimension to capture for both the crawl space or the attic. And then another really important question when you're looking at attics and crawl spaces is you have all these new circuits that are going to be run. They're either going to be run in the crawl space, the attic, or potentially on the outside of the home. So as you're looking at the attic and the crawl space, you know, assessing kind of which is most likely, which, which looks the best to you. If they don't have a crawl space, let's say they have a um, concrete foundation, they're not going to be running any um, circuits through that. So they're going to have to go through um, an attic. Similarly, they may not have an attic. They may just have a flat roof and, and, and no actual attic. So in that case, um, if they don't have an attic or a crawl space, there may be conduit running like along the eaves, for example, for these new circuits. Next one. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. So um, vents, ducts, and wall insulation. Noticing um, how many heating vents are there in the home. That's important for people quoting new duct work. Um, they'll go by number of vents. Um, how many air returns are there? So if there's only one air return, that can have some sizing limitations for your, um, for your heat pump HVAC system. And Tom will get into that. Um, are the vents in the floor, ceiling, or wall? That'll give the um, contractors an idea of how challenging it would be to add new, new ductwork or replace ductwork. Um, what's the condition of it? Is it kind of falling apart? Um, has it been eaten by animals? Is there asbestos there? Um, what, is the, um, what does the insulation look like around the ductwork? What's the diameter of the ductwork? And again, this can be estimated just by eye, just to um, help us both with sizing the HVAC system and if ductwork needs to be re replaced, letting the contractor know what size um, ductwork they're, they're working with. Um, looking at the walls is important to know, are, are the walls insulated? Is that an opportunity for increasing insulation and keeping that HVAC system smaller? Um, or are they already insulated and, and that isn't an opportunity? And then is there knob and tube wiring possibly in the walls that would prevent insulation? Next slide. For solar battery, what is the roof material? If it's comp, that's great. If it's shake, a little trickier with solar. Are there any big trees that are providing shade um, that might inhibit the insulation of a, of a solar system? And then for a battery system, um, which is usually going to go in the garage or near a main panel, like what would 
the homeowner think might be a good location for the battery. Next slide. Okay, so now your data gathering is complete. So assuming you're not doing a manual J calculation for HVAC, which Tom is gonna get into in great detail, you've got all the data you now need for your plan. So next step, which we'll go into um, for classes two and three is, um, well, today we'll, Tom will cover HVAC load calculations. And then at our next class, we'll talk about doing electrical load calculations with all of those um, nameplate ratings that you collected and equipment um, ideas about new equipment that the homeowner is interested in. Um, equipment selection we'll cover in the next class. And then in the final class, we'll cover wiring plans and then kind of bringing it all together into a project plan for the contractors to help them know what's needed. Next slide. And Tom, it's over to you. All right, thanks so much, Josie. And next slide, please. So I'm gonna be going over kind of a dry topic. Uh, it's it's maybe interesting to us engineers and the building professionals, uh, but a lot of times the homeowners leave this over to the HVAC pros. And, but anyway, I, I need to dig through these details so that you, it, those of you who wanna learn how to do these things can do it. Uh, but what are, what are we doing about sizing heat pumps and why do we size them? and and the size of a heat pump is described in a unit called tons. And it's it's a thermal power of a heat pump. And a ton is 12,000 BTUs per hour. So it's a rate of delivering heating or cooling. Uh, and the reason we size these things is for comfort. So we want a system that is big enough to get the job done, but not so big that it cycles off a lot. And then your house is kind of free floating and coasting, and then it yanks back on and, and jerks you up to the comfort temperature. So we want one that's kind of well matched for the home. And then also a good sizing will help with energy savings and operating cost savings. Also, a smaller heat pump, well-sized, will will be quieter than a big heat pump trying to jam a lot of air through the ductwork. And then for capital cost savings, what we're seeing out in the equipment world is that um, uh, the cost of heat pumps kind of takes a jump upward above three ton size. And so what our idea is, is to just size it right the first time. Next slide. So there are, you know, here are four methods we see used all the time. Uh, or actually three of them. <laughs> and so from the top of the list is the worst, but it's just to put in the same size equipment as has been there before. And so, for example, if the furnace was 60,000 BTUs per hour, putting in a five ton heat pump, five times 12,000 is 60,000. Well, that's just way too big for the house. And um, and the heat pump would be cycling on and off a lot like the furnace did, and that's not good. Um, so another is to follow some other region's rule of thumb. And you see on the internet, lots of national rules of thumb for how many square feet per ton of heat pump. And those you know, tend to oversize in our mild coastal climate as well. But they, they're quick estimates, but they get you the wrong sized equipment. The third method on there is what the, uh, the code says you ought to be doing, which is performing this manual J calculation. That's just the name of the calculation. And it's performed independent of the family who lives there already. And it takes uh, hours, uh, four to six hours when I try to do it, uh, to do all the measurement and calculations and keep track of the data. And uh, it can result in better sized heat pumps. And then the the fourth one is the one uh, that we've developed basing it on this smart meter gas data. So picking the peak winter days gas use and using it to figure out how much heat was needed and then how much heat pump is needed to deliver that much and next. So the manual J method, I have to go through that one first. During the site visits, Josie and I would spend an hour with a tape measure and two of us on each, you know, one of us on each end of the tape measure, measuring all the lengths of the walls all the way around the house, making a sketch floor plan and measuring the, the dimensions of each window to the nearest inch and, um, and each door and doorway, keeping track of all that, um, getting uh, the estimate of the floor area from that taking a look at the different types of 
floors, like the floor, sometimes the floor is on a concrete slab, sometimes it's over a crawl space or a basement. It doesn't matter if you, you don't re really need to measure the second floor level because it's conditioned on both sides, but we're just measuring the surface area of everything that's kind of exposed to either outdoor conditions or semi-conditioned space, like the area of a wall up against the garage between the house and the garage. That's another special case and looking at chimneys. Anyway, we do all those measurements. And then the other thing is we have to make an estimate of the amount of air leakage in house volumes per air, or air, air changes per hour. That's what this ACH means. So we're, we're making a lot of measurements and next and collecting a lot of data. And then we also need to be noting at the time, okay, what are the materials being used in the roof and the attic? Is it, uh, is it sheetrock? Is it lath and plaster on the walls? Is it uh, stucco on the outside or wood siding? Uh, those kind of things. And then we're, keep, we're taking notes also about all these different windows we see. Is that window single pane or double pane? The double pane windows maybe lose half as much heat as the single pane. And so anyway, we're keeping track of those materials next. Also, we were looking at, when we look at the walls, we need to determine is the wall insulated or not insulated? And Josie also mentioned we visit the attic and the crawl space. And so we're looking for insulation there. We're, we're sticking a tape measure down through it if we can, to, just to see how thick it is um, in inches, just to figure out what that R value is from other factors and oh, R value is the resistance value of each thing in a house for passing heat through it. And the inverse of an R value is the U value. That's how conductive it is, how much heat is conducted through a piece of material. So we're going to, you know, when we're doing these manual J calculations, we look from the inside air film, like the air up against the wall here, is it got a little bit of R value. Then the sheetrock in my house, it's lath and plaster behind it. It's got a little bit of R value. The vapor barrier inside the wall has some R value. The airspace, this used to be a hollow wall. I blew insulation in there once. And so what is that airspace or insulation R value? Then the sheathing material, mine has diagonal boards on the outside and you know, they were about uh, three quarter inch thick and that's about R three quarters. And then house wrap, if that's there and stucco and the exterior air film on the outdoor. So you add them all up and you can add up these R values and they sum up to the total R value of the wall. And if you invert that, it gives the conductance. Next slide. And so this is a diagram I got off a website called uh, builderscalculator.com. It's a nice website that has uh, things like the R values for different materials there. And so I show their diagram and I've written a few notes in there about what is the R value of the different materials in their diagram and then tabulated it over here. Like my wall behind me that used to be hollow. When I had that type of wall, it was about R4. So it had a resistance of four. It has a U value then of one over four. I invert the four, which means 0.25. And there was 0.25 BTUs of energy. And a BTU is an amount, a small amount of energy. It's about the amount released when you burn a whole kitchen match, one of those wooden kitchen matches. So it's the U value is in one quarter BTU per square foot of wall per degree Fahrenheit difference between the inside and the outside per hour of time. And so it's giving us a heat flow rate for a temperature difference and an area. And so anyway, we, we uh, can multiply those things by the areas of the walls we have and by the design temperature difference in the climate that we're dealing with and how high somebody wants their thermostat set. When we multiply all that together, we can get the heat load on the house. In the insulated column, you can see Everything's the same in all those R values, except the airspace had an R value of one, this hollow airspace, roughly. And then uh, when I insulated mine, I, raised, I replaced that one with an 11. So the R value went from four to 14 by adding R11 in there. Next. So we have to keep track of all these manual J assemblies. So it's for each different type of wall I have in the house. 
and there might be one insulated with fiberglass and another one with blown in insulation and then whether the walls facing the garage you know into the garage in its semi-conditioned space or unconditioned space but it's not full outdoors where it gets all the way down to 30 degrees <laughs> you know my garage never gets below 50. so um anyway it depends on what it's facing but we basically have to keep track of each of these assemblies what they're facing and seeing and what they're made of next all right and then we take those u values that i described by adding up the r values inverting it to get the u value you multiply it by the areas that's the a in the ua and so we're we then know the heat transfer rate for the design condition if we know the design condition let's say is 30 degrees fahrenheit and uh and then it's 70 indoors and so that's a 40 degree difference uh for the design condition and we multiply that by the uas we know the amount of heat passing through the surface during the design condition and so in the manual j method they're trying to keep up with that heat loss and next so they sum all those design heat loss rates for all the components uh and keeping track of what they were and there's a lot of data tracking in this stuff there's software out there and spreadsheets you can get online to do this for you and some more sophisticated apps too that can do other things like sizing ductwork but anyway when you sum it all up it's the design heat loss rate of the surfaces so all the building components and next all right but I said surfaces there's one more big component in the way we construct houses and that's the air infiltration so our houses leak a certain amount of air out or have direct ventilation to to keep getting us fresh air typically uh, a house will, will leak about one volume per hour so one air change ACH per hour might happen in a two-story house like mine and maybe it's a little lower say 0.9 house volumes per hour in a one-story house well why is it higher in the two-story house well because in that design condition when it's cold outside my two-story house is like a two-story chimney full of warm air and so it tends to be able to drive a little more air air leakage because that cold air can come in and get through my two-story tall chimney house <laughs> a little better so so uh, we can do estimates of it but in more severe climates where there's where the air is really cold outside say zero or negative 20 Fahrenheit people really probably ought to be using blower door tests and get an even better handle on these these estimates for what is air leakage and anyway so I do one calculation down here to show you one air change per hour in a 2,000 square foot house with eight foot walls would be 16,000 cubic feet of infiltration per hour and the heat capacity of air is 0.018 uh, yeah 0.018 sorry about the typo there um but it's it, it Kind of amounts to around 11,000 BTUs per hour in the design condition. So have to, I'll check my math later. And next calculation, excuse me, next uh, slide. So we got to sum up the all the surface uh, heat transfer rates and the infiltration together to get the total for the building. In this case, 33,000 in the example BTUs per hour. That's what BTU H means. And uh, for a house with central heating and ductwork, ductwork tends to lose an additional 20%. And so we're, you know, think about that design condition where it's one of the coldest days of the year, the, the furnace is pushing air into the ductwork, the ductwork loses about 20% of the energy, part of it through conduction, because the ducts only have maybe R4 insulation around them, or R6 or R8, it's not very thick insulation. Uh, not compared to my walls that are R11. So it's it's kind of one of the less insulated parts of the house. And plus, it's got some of the hottest air in it, you know, maybe 120 degrees or with heat pumps, maybe 110 degree air in there. And so it's a big temperature difference. So it's got that conduction going on and then also ductwork gets leaky over time, especially if the cable guy crawls across it or something like that. So um, anyway, when we total up the surfaces plus the insulation plus the ductwork in this example, we get 40,000 BTUs per hour 
if I divide that by 12,000 BTUs per hour in a ton, it tells me 3.3 tons of heat pump is the size of a heat pump that would meet my needs. Heat pumps are kind of sold in nominal half ton sizes. You could get a three ton unit or a, or a three and a half ton unit typically, but you can look through tables of heat pumps and find what you need and next. But, but what I was showing you there with all the different surfaces and tracking it uh, and some big assumptions, there, there were essentially about a hundred assumptions and measurements going on. So lots of chances to you know, have little errors there, but also, you know, lots to keep track of. A lot of analysis is breaking one big guess into lots of little guesses and trying to get the little ones right and sum up the answers. So here, I'm going to go now through a quicker method, uh, this peak day gas usage method next. All right, so in this one, we, we're just assuming that, okay, the future peak days are going to be similar to the prior peak day for the year, so the coldest winter day for this family. And this is going to apply to the family living in the house because all their behaviors determined, you know, their behaviors plus what the house was doing, it all determined what was the gas use in the cold day. So we determined how much gas heat they needed in that prior peak day, and then we size a heat pump to be able to deliver that much heat in a reasonable number of hours in a day. Next. So we get that smart utility data. And so that's really nice that nowadays we've got smart utility data. When I learned manual J 45 years ago, we didn't have smart meters. So we had to use manual J type methods, but we, we can take a look at the summer gas use and that might be for their water heater and their cooking and maybe clothes drying if they have that. And we figure out what that is. And so in, in an example, let's say it was 0.4 therms of gas per day. And a therm of gas is 100,000 BTUs of gas. And so if we see the summers, they're using on average 0.4 therms and the peak winter day, they might use 5.1 therms in my example. And next we'll see a little bit about the example. This is taking a look at the at smart meter data over the course of a year here. And you can see the big tall thing across the middle is the winter usage. And then the low part uh, towards the end is the, is the summer. And the green line is showing you where I might have noticed the average being at say 0.4 therms per day in summer. And so I'm gonna subtract that from the winter peak day usage. So let's go to the next graph. So now this one, that, that, that other one I just showed you was averaged over three days. It was a three-day rolling average. This is the way we get the data up here in PG&E territory. It's in one number per day, and it's rounded to the nearest uh, integer of therms. So, so you can see a lot of these at one therm, at two therms, three therms, four, and five. There's one of them up to five. And... And so then you can see in the summer, it's like there's space between them because it took a while to hit one whole therm and count it. It took you know two and a half days. That's why I'm using 0.4 therms as the summer use and 5.1. You can see, and uh, hopefully in your view, uh, that's the, the uh, highest winter day use. Next picture. All right. So going on with this method, we subtract the summer gas average from the winter peak. So 5.1 in the winter peak minus 0.4 is, gives 4.7 therms of gas. And so that was the highest gas use on a peak day. And let's say we looked at the furnace and its, its nameplate indicated it was 80% efficient at producing heat out of gas. And the other 20% of the energy from the gas went up the furnace uh, stack out to the outdoors that has exhaust. And so in that um, peak day, it needed 80% of 4.7 therms. So I, I do that calculation down there at the bottom, 4.7 therms times 80% times 100,000 BTUs per therm tells me 376,000 BTUs of heat were needed on the peak day. Next. 
So I'm going to convert the 376,000 BTUs of heat into ton hours. And I told you before a ton was 12,000 BTUs per hour. So I divide 376 by 12, I get 31.3 ton hours of heat needed in the peak day. And so I'm going to use that 31.3 in a minute. But just, you know, the other little tidbit I can tell you is, oh, well, that furnace that we were looking at it also produced 376,000 BTUs of heat by using uh, 4.7 therms of gas, but it only had a delivery rate of about 60,000 BTUs per hour. So it ran for about 6.3 hours in that peak day. So even on the coldest day of the year, the furnace wasn't needed the whole day. It was on and off cycling. Okay, next. All right, so I'm back here. I'm going to pick the heat pump size that can deliver the needed heat for the peak day. So 31 ton hours needed divided. I'm going to pick a number to divide by. And this is where the art and a big assumption comes in in this method. I'm going to pick, in this case, 13 hours. Uh, just saying, if the heat pump, if, if we're home on the coldest day and the heat pump's running, I'm, I'd be happy to size a heat pump that can meet that coldest day's needs by running at its rated power for 13 hours. And that gives it plenty of time in case the day got even colder in the future or, uh, or not. So anyway, if I divide the 31.3 by the 13 hours, I get 2.4 tons of power, uh, thermal power on the heat pump needed to provide the heat at the bonnet of the ductwork. So that's how much it has to put out into the, into the ductwork. And so I could use a 2.4 ton uh, central heat pump, or if I were to use a ductless heat pump, one where it had different individual units in the rooms and didn't have ductwork that, that loses heat, I could get by without that 20% duct heat loss. And maybe I could get by with 1.9 tons of heat pump. So anyway, this method is really the culmination of looking back at reality over the prior year for that home and their smart meter and making the four, making four assumptions I'll get to in a moment. Next slide. This, this one is just showing a little bit of the trade-off and the bottom axis is assumed running hours per peak day. So for that peak day we had in the prior year, you can see from four hours to 24 hours running on the bottom axis. And then the vertical axis has two different values. The little blue diamonds there are the heat pump size in tons that it would take to deliver the daily amount of energy when running only for that number of hours. And you can see if I'm willing to run the heat pump all 24 hours on the far right, it only takes about a one and a half ton heat pump. That's where the blue diamond is at the one and a half space there or if i was only if i was trying to meet my needs in only uh let's see seven hours it would take a five ton heat pump that's where the blue dot is roughly above where the invisible seven is on the number of hours and so both of those sizes of heat pump could do it but the big heat pump has got some problems with it it's it's going to have a lot of issues with the duct work, it's going to be noisy, and it's going to be costly. So I put the green line that we've learned from contractors across there at about three tons. They say typical gas um, duct, gas fire duct work that we're trying to reuse is sized in a way for really hot air from the furnace. And with the, with the warm air from a heat pump, at maybe 110 degrees instead of say 150 degrees from a furnace, it uh, we kind of top out at about three ton, three ton size of heat pump is about the amount of heat pump heating we can get through existing duct work. So, so then I start looking at that issue and go, okay, yeah, I want to stay below three tons. And so I may have been picking that 13 hours in the example. And then the other red boxes on there is just another tidbit calculation I can do, which uh, for the, the house in my prior example, I didn't show you all the calculations of the heat capacity of the house, but but uh, it's giving me a feeling for how fast the heat pump size 
can raise the temperature of the house in the design condition in degrees per hour. So those, those units, one through seven on the left, they have two different units. One is the size of heat pump it is in tons, and the other is degrees per hour. And so at that roughly 13 hour point, I've got a, a heat pump that's say uh, around two and a half tons or a little bigger, and it's able to raise the temperature of, uh, at about almost two degrees per hour. And so that'll help me in talking with the client about, okay, what to expect from operating the heat pump? How, how much of a running start do you have to give it to hit any target temperature? You know, give it more time or how, how low can you set it at night and still catch up to your target temperature by whatever your favorite time is, say 7 a.m. Next slide. All right, so in that peak day gas use method, the assumptions we were making is that the peak day um, meter reading rounding error is small enough. And I see down in Southern California gas, you guys are getting your data down to one hundredth of a therm. Here in PG&E territory, we get it only down to one whole therm. So you've got a hundred times more precision down there than we do. And uh, the next assumption is that the future will be similar to the recent past. So let's say you had a pretty warm year the prior winter. You need to be a little bit careful. Did that really hit the peak? You know, was that the what the future peak is like? Are all the winters warm from now on? Uh, knock on wood that the climate doesn't change. But uh, anyway, we, we can make some adjustments there. And then also that the, we knew the nameplate efficiency of the furnace and that, that uh, you know, we like that you know, whatever time we pick, 12 hours, 13 hours, 16 hours. And it's really just a, a trade-off matter at that point. Next. So that, that peak day gas usage method kind of quickly gives us some real world answers. And that then there are some operating adjustments you can make like running the unit longer in the peak day in real life if you need to. Um, and then you can always add insulation. And for an added insulation project, you can separately do that same kind of UA value calculation I was showing you in Manual J. You could do it just for the surface you wanted to insulate. Let's say I don't have to know it for everything in my house, but I know, you know, I'm, I'm interested in adding to the insulation to the attic. I've got R19 now, and I want to check out what happens if I go to R38 or to R50. And so you can do those UA calculations just on the surface you're trying to evaluate and see, does that give me some economics I like and let me downsize the heat pump? Um, and do I like that? But you've already seen from my heat pump sizing graph, you're just moderating your expectations on how long the thing runs also lets you resize your heat pump. And next slide. So the kind of manual J, cons and pros. <laughs> so the cons from that manual J first method I show you is you have to collect a lot of data. You have to make a lot of estimates and assumptions, and it's a lot of effort in doing that and then paying attention to not losing anything or misplacing, you know, forgetting a surface that's, that's still there. So take some attention. And then the pros for the manual J method is it, it it's already set up to help you explore the dollar value of insulation projects and air sealing projects, and it can help you explore room by room issues. Like, let's say you've got a room that feels extra cold in the winter. Well, you can do the manual J calculations on that room compared to the rest of the house and see what's going on there and whether an insulation project in that room is something that makes sense. And then, then it can also let you explore insulation to help downsize the heat pump. And next slide. So a little bit of time comparison of the methods, uh, manual J, um, I've kind of broken all the things out in rows there, gathering data offsite, uh, gathering data onsite, making measurements, it was pretty time intense. Josie and I were spending about an hour with two of us doing that. Entering the data into spreadsheets, et cetera, uh, takes more time for me <laughs> reorganizing it sometimes. Then doing the calculations, it's either zero or if you're doing them by hand, it can be a while um, on spreadsheets, et cetera. But if it, you're just entering it into some package software, the calculations go quick. And then it can also give you room information uh, that's pretty nice. And then it 
it, the manual J provides about half the information you need for air conditioning sizing, but I find in coastal California, air conditioning sizing is not the crucial thing. Sizing it for the heating is, and the air conditioning is, is kind of a nice benefit. The systems we've been noticing that are big enough for heating are also big enough for cooling, so we don't need them bigger. Anyway, the total minutes are something like uh, 13 to a minutes on the peak day usage method versus 10 times as much time on the manual J method. So 130 to, to minutes, you know, so two, two to three and a half, four hours. But the manual J is really nice for new house plans because you can do all this measurement and calculation off of plans and you don't have a gas bill for the new house. And then they... The peak day gas usage is really good for retrofits where you've got a real family living in a real house with its real leaks and you can capture it all in the gas use. Next slide. All right. Thanks so much for bearing with me through the dry topic of HVAC sizing. All right. Thanks, Tom and Josie. Um, so that, uh, that wraps up the presentation. We can open it up for questions if you've got a question. Um, you can feel free to put it into the chat. We'll continue to monitor that or um, use the raise hand function and I can call on folks individually. So yes, I will send out a copy of uh, or a link to the recording and a copy of the um, presentation slides, which will have some links in them. Any other questions for Josie or Tom? Yeah, I just put a link in the chat for that builder's calculator uh, website that I took a little picture of the wall cross section in case folks want to visit that one. They have a lot of different calculator forms there. I just was using their heat loss uh, page. Uh, Joseph, can you maybe elaborate a bit on what your question is? I see using probable heat pump. Can you elaborate a bit? Yeah, probably easier to speak than <laughs> typing in. Well, I was looking, I have a small condo uh, uh, instead of doing how, because the HOA have to go through a whole lot to put an actual heat pump, you know, inside, but I'm looking at it uh, uh, in my house that the worst, you know, I can just two, use two portable, one in the family room, one in, in the master, and that I don't need to upgrade any electrical, but I don't know, is that a good permanent situation? Uh, if I can get by with that, that I would save a lot of time and money. Yeah, yeah, I, I've installed a couple of the portable heat pumps and developed a preference for different ones. So most of them are just on off devices. They don't have inverter drive, but there are a couple of models on the market that do have an inverter driven system. And so they're able to go at partial speeds, which makes them a lot nicer to live with. They can go, they can be at, you know, one third speed, half speed three quarters full speed. So they have different noise levels at each of those speeds. So that's why it's kind of nice to be able to have the inverter driven one that can run quietly for long hours. The, so that's my first criteria on what I want in a portable heat pump or a stationary one is inverter driven. Second one on the portables, they connect uh, to the outside through air hoses that go through the bottom of the window. And the, the, Good ones are use two hoses. They suck outdoor air in in the winter. They're sucking it into the machine, grabbing the heat out of it, making that outdoor air cold because they grab the heat out of it and blowing that cold air back out the other hose out of the house. And uh, then they they take the heat in the machine and they circulate room air past that heat to, to heat up the room. And so that's working well. So you want it to have dual hoses, it, and then, um, because if it only has a single hose, you get the problem of it's grabbing 
room air and getting the heat or or you know, out of it and then blowing the cold room air out which drew a vacuum on the house that sucked in more outdoor air and so that's a problem so so dual hose and inverter driven are the two things i look for in a portable heat pump and uh, i've done some calculations and it kind of shows me that you could save about a hundred therms per year with a portable heat pump if you were really trying to run it uh, for most of your heating. And then you could be using your furnace to do the other couple of therms or dozens of therms it might take to do the peak heating. Well, one more thing about the portable heat pumps, uh, they uh, if they don't have a defrost cycle, and most of them don't, they tend to cut out at about uh, 37 Fahrenheit outside. So they'll still be doing heat pumping when it's you know 50, 45, 40 degrees. But then when it's 37 or lower, they turn off the heat pump and they either have a resistor to give you heat or they're not doing anything. So, so it's uh, probably only good uh, you know, in our coastal California climates. Uh, it's not good in the mountains type of thing. Yeah, and I'll just jump in and say, um, Tom's really the expert here, but um, you know, the size of the unit matters, just making sure. I think the limitation on the portable systems is their size and how much um, heat they can deliver to a room. So you wouldn't put, say, like a single portable unit in a 5,000 square foot home. But if it's a small unit and it's sized right, then yeah, I think that can work well. Thanks. All right, um, thank so you. Give me something to look at, yeah. Thanks, Joseph. So Bill's asking if there's a website that outlines the gas consumption calculations. And Josie, does uh, maybe your tools the closest that the world has? I forget. <laughs> yeah. So that? can can you clarify by by the gas consumption calculations, meaning the gas consumption data that is downloaded from the utility, or um, kind of then what Tom walked through? In two different, well, he walked through it, I guess, with the alternative method. It's there in the slides. We also, so Tom and I, when we do this work for people, we realized we needed a um, like our own tool to collect all the photos and measurements, et cetera. So we created like a, an online tool um, that can help you gather this data and do some of the calculations quickly. So I'm happy to share that if that would be helpful for people. That might be a place to, if you wanted to try to do this, say for your own home, a place to go to kind of get started. And the the slides roughly mirror the data that um, that, that tool would ask you for. But um, in that tool, you just upload your gas data and it sort of does it automatically behind the scenes. Tom's slides really sort of show the math behind that if, if that's what, um, what Bill was asking. But yeah, I'll drop the um, link in the chat. Yeah, sounds like there's there's interest for that. Um, David is asking if there's room on a panel, wouldn't a high efficiency on demand electric water heater such as a Steiner Electron Plus be better than a heat pump that runs when hot water isn't being used? Yeah, I, I'm just typing an answer to him. I'll say it out loud too. Uh, not really, because electric resistance, which is what's used in those on-demand heaters, uh, which is just the same thing my toaster uses to toast bread, is only 100% efficient at converting the electricity into initial heat. And it can't be any more than that. It's not grabbing heat from anywhere. So it's limited at 100% and it has to be super powerful in order to meet our hot water needs. Uh, you know, instantly heating that uh, gallon and a half per minute for a shower head. Okay, but a heat pump water heater, um, it uses uh, electricity to run a, a motor in a compressor that gathers heat. It'll gather three units of heat from the outdoors or the garage, and it'll put one unit of the electric energy plus the three units of thermal energy into four units of heating in the water. So it can be 400% efficient. And then the tank losses, which is probably what people are concerned with when they're thinking of instant water heaters, uh, why those have an advantage. The tank losses, I noticed from my heat pump water heater, it's 
it's uh, about 50 watt hours a day. My heat pump water heater will turn on for a short period and reheat itself when I'm on vacation. I'll, I'll come back and I'll see the records and I can see it. it's you know only using about 50 watt hours a day to reheat itself. And so it doesn't have much tank losses, but it has a huge efficiency gain and then a great power savings. And then also in the chat, somebody mentioned the um, these lower amp uh, heat pump water heaters, and we'll be definitely getting to those in our future classes. This was just a big overview of why do planning and then a little bit of down the weeds. How do you do heat loss calculations? But we will definitely get to all the advantages of picking power, uh, power efficient equipment. Uh, and and how it lets you stay on your electric panel. Yeah, I'll just chime in with maybe some stronger words. Um, one of the most challenging situations that we face is when people have already done a big remodel and they got rid of their tank water heater and they went with a gas tankless water heater. These are like our nemesis. Um, yes, you know, so the person had to get a bigger uh, gas line coming into their home. So they're getting lots of gas into the home and they don't have space anymore for a tank. Um, cause with a heat pump water heater, which is really your ideal solution. If you're going to electrify, you need a tank. Um, so this is a really challenging situation. Some of, some of the people who now have the on-demand or gas, uh, tankless gas water heaters, they want to go to electric tankless and those just use incredible amounts of power. There, um, you're definitely going to have to upsize your service line connection. Probably, it's going to add grid stress. Um, you know, imagine just trying to heat something from 55 degrees, which is the water coming into the home, up to 120 instantly. You just need a ton of power. So those are very um, power inefficient, um, and I would try to avoid them at all costs. So find a space, maybe go to a combo washer dryer, find a space in your garage or wherever for, um, for a tank heat pump water heater if possible and um, discourage all of your friends from going over to those on-demand water heaters because <laughs> they make our jobs hard. So I think we've got quite time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, if we don't get to your question that's in the chat, we will answer it in our follow-up communications. Um, Meredith lives in a 50-year-old home and she keeps hearing that the installation of a heat pump is very important. She's wondering if uh, they're referring to getting it sized right or other concerns. Hmm. I don't know. I wonder if Meredith would be willing to come on and just say a little bit more about what the because I'm not sure. Um, I mean, the, I think making sure it's size right is important. Um, you know, picking an installer that you like. Sometimes around here, you know, we have installers who do both gas furnaces and heat pumps, and you call them for a heat pump, and then they come to your house and they try to talk you into doing another gas furnace. So that's a problem. Um, so if anyone does that, I would say, you know, find another contractor who, if you say you want a heat pump, is going to work with you to get a heat pump installed. Um, so those would be sort of the things I would think about. And again, thinking with a whole home in mind, right? So I guess the other, maybe another issue that might come up with heat pump HVAC installers is maybe they only do carrier or they only do train. And some of those American brands, they, they, they're not the most power efficient. So the Japanese brands tend to be more power efficient. So um, Mitsubishi in particular is sort of state of the art. And so um, maybe they're gonna recommend a four ton system that is 40 amps versus a three ton system that would be 17 amps. So if you have your HVAC installer who can do multiple brands and they aren't like wedded to one especially the American brands, then you probably are going to get a better recommendation from them and a better system in the end. Oh, and Meredith, if we didn't quite answer your question and you want to chime in, please feel free. Um, one other, not necessarily a question, but a comment. There's often a lot of water loss with water heaters that don't recirculate. Uh, this is an important efficiency issue of another sort. So just pointing out water efficiency as well. Right, I, I've been trained, I'm still using the bucket when I'm 
turning on the shower to to uh, wait for the hot water in my house. My heat pump water heater is down in the basement, and then our master shower is two floors higher above it. And when we put in the piping, we hadn't gone to the new modern method of even smaller diameter pipes to get the water there faster. But uh, you know, I think in new design now, people are looking at using the small flexible uh, piping in order to, to get hot water to the fixtures quick. And that's one way they're dealing with it. And then they don't need a bucket. Um, and I'll just jump in. We work in homes where people have recirc pumps. And when we look at their gas bills, like their summer gas bills, they're on vacation. And we expect there to be like zero gas usage in that home, right? Because they're on vacation for two weeks, let's say in the summer. And people have research pumps are, it's quite high, actually. It's shocking how much natural gas those research pumps, because they're constantly heating the water in the, um, in the pipe to try to keep it to, you know, you're on vacation and it's trying to keep it 120 in the pipe constantly. So it's just circulating and your, your um, gas water heater's coming on and all while you're, you know, in, on vacation and, you know, Bahamas or whatever. So uh, those things use a lot of natural gas. So there is this tension between saving water and reducing your carbon footprint. But from my perspective, the carbon footprint impacts are huge for those research pumps. So that's one of the reasons we don't like them and they don't play well with heat pump water heaters. All right. I think that is all the time we have for questions. Again, if you've got others, please put them in the chat, chat or reach out to us afterwards. Um, thank you guys for joining us today. We do have two more classes in this series. Again, we'll send out links to register for those if you're not already. Um, the slides recording and a survey will be sent your way in the next couple of days. So please do fill that out. Um, and yeah, if you haven't registered, uh, please do for the next couple and we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Yep. Thank you all. Thanks.